Balaam begins speaking toward the people of Israel. But where others wanted cursing, only blessing comes. Blessing in the form of a king. On The Bible Brief. We can miss the point of a story if we don't properly understand its structure. Structure emphasizes important aspects, and structure helps us understand the goal of the story itself. Said simply, structure matters. And in the story of Balaam and Balak, we might miss the whole point of the story if we miss the structural clues along the way. In this narrative, there's a structural repetition that we need to pay attention to. It's a repetition of threes. You might even say that the number three is the unifying feature of the narrative of Balak and Balaam. Three just keeps popping up. So far in the story, we saw three responses from God to Balaam's summons to Moab. And in the story of the third response, we saw the odd narrative of Balaam's donkey veering off of the course that Balaam had directed. And do you remember how many times the donkey veered off course? That's right three times. And it was after the third time that we saw the most significant event in this whole narrative so far. God opened the mouth of the donkey to speak, and he opened the eyes of Balaam to see the angel of the Lord in front of him. In this account, we're beginning to pick up a pattern in the structure of the story. It's a pattern of threes, with something significant occurring on the third part of each set of three. The structure is giving us a clue to the remainder of the story. Look for a set of threes, and look for something significant at the third part of the set. So let's pick up the story where we left off. On his journey to Moab, Balaam has had an interaction with his temporarily speaking donkey and with the angel of the Lord. The angel expressly told Balaam that he must only speak what God tells him to speak when he gets to Moab. After that encounter, Balaam sets off again to meet Balak the king as Balak has summoned Balaam there to curse this nation of Israel encamped in the plain. Let's listen to their conversation, which takes place on a mountaintop, looking at part of the Israelite camp, beginning in Numbers chapter 23. And Balaam said to Balak, Build for me here seven altars, and prepare for me here seven bulls and seven rams. Balak did as Balaam had said, and Balak and Balaam offered on each altar a bull and a ram. And Balaam said to Balak, Stand beside your burnt offering, and I will go. Perhaps the Lord will come to meet me, and whatever he shows me I will tell you. And he went to a bare height, and God met Balaam. Balaam has Balak prepare altars and sacrificial animals. Presumably these were rituals that Balaam was accustomed to performing in an attempt to summon the response of pagan gods. God has already spoken to Balaam without all this ritual, So there's a high likelihood that Balaam is doing this for show. After all, Balak needs to feel like he's getting his money's worth. But despite the ritual, God has something in mind for Balaam that has nothing to do with the ritual. He's going to put words in Balaam's mouth that he is to speak to Balak. And the Lord put a word in Balaam's mouth and said, Return to Balak, and thus you shall speak. And he returned to him, and behold, he and all the princes of Moab were standing beside his burnt offering. And Balaam took up his discourse and said, From Aram Balak has brought me, the king of Moab from the eastern mountains. Come, curse Jacob for me, and come, denounce Israel. How can I curse whom God has not cursed? How can I denounce whom the Lord has not denounced? For from the top of the crags I see him. From the hills I behold him. Behold, a people dwelling alone, and not counting itself among the nations. Who can count the dust of Jacob, or number the fourth part of Israel? Let me die the death of the upright, and let my end be like his. And Balak said to Balaam, What have you done to me? I took you to curse my enemies, and behold, you have done nothing but bless them. And Balaam answered and said, Must I not take care to speak what the Lord puts in my mouth? Balak is shocked at what has just come out of the mouth of Balaam. That's not what he paid the pagan prophet to do. Balaam was supposed to curse Israel, not bless them. And yet in his first prophetic discourse, Balaam says that he cannot curse Israel before calling them a unique and upright nation set apart from all the other nations of the world. Just as the donkey's mouth was opened by God, 
So this dumb and blind prophet has had his mouth filled with God's words. But Balak isn't finished trying to get what he paid for. And Balak said to Balaam, Please come with me to another place from which you may see them. You shall see only a fraction of them and not see them all. Then curse them for me from there. So the men and their companions go to a different mountain to look over a different portion of the Israelite camp. And they soon set up seven altars and repeat the sacrifices the same as before. Balaam receives words from God, and you can imagine Balak's bated breath just waiting for Balaam to finally curse his enemies. But we read this. Balaam took up his discourse and said, Rise, Balak, and hear. Give ear to me, O son of Zippor. God is not a man that he should lie, or a son of man that he should change his mind. Has he said, and will he not do it? Or has he spoken, and will he not fulfill it? Behold, I received a command to bless. He has blessed, and I cannot revoke it. He has not beheld misfortune in Jacob, nor has he seen trouble in Israel. The Lord their God is with them, and the shout of a king is among them. God brings them out of Egypt, and is for them like the horns of a wild ox. For there is no enchantment against Jacob, no divination against Israel. Now it shall be said of Jacob and Israel, What has God wrought? Behold a people, as a lioness it rises up, and as a lion it lifts itself. It does not lie down until it has devoured the prey and drunk the blood of the slain. And Balak said to Balaam, Do not curse them at all, and do not bless them at all. But Balaam answered Balak, Did I not tell you all that the Lord says that I must do? In this second attempt at cursing, Balak is again disappointed by the blessing pronounced by Balaam. In this second prophetic discourse, God's words through Balaam speak of the blessedness of the nation of Israel, who has Yahweh as their God, fighting for them as they utterly defeat all of their enemies. No curse can stand against Israel, because God has blessed them. But Balak won't give up. For some superstitious reason, it even appears that he thinks the location of the sacrifices is causing Balaam to speak in this way. So Balak decides to change the venue yet again. Surely this third attempt at cursing will succeed where the others had failed. Little does Balak know that God has something special planned for this third part of this set of three attempts at cursing. The men and their companions travel yet again to a third mountain lookout, this time looking over the whole of the Israelite camp. They set up the same manner of sacrifices, and Balak has the same request of Balaam. But this time, when God gives him words to speak, it's in a different manner than before. This time, the Spirit of God himself comes upon the prophet, gives him words, and gives him eyes to see. Just as his eyes were opened to see the angel of the Lord on the way to Moab, so here his eyes are opened to see what God is doing. And Balaam lifted up his eyes and saw Israel camping tribe by tribe. And the Spirit of God came upon him, and he took up his discourse and said, The oracle of Balaam the son of Baor, the oracle of a man whose eye is opened, the oracle of him who hears the words of God, who sees the vision of the Almighty, falling down with his eyes uncovered. How lovely are your tents, O Jacob, your encampments, O Israel, like palm groves that stretch afar, like gardens beside a river, like aloes that the Lord has planted, like cedar trees beside the waters. Water shall flow from his buckets, and his seed shall be in many waters. His king shall be higher than Agag, and his kingdom shall be exalted. God brings him out of Egypt, and is for him like the horns of the wild ox. He shall eat up the nations, his adversaries, and shall break their bones in pieces, and pierce them through with his arrows. He crouched, he lay down like a lion and like a lioness. Who will rouse him up? Blessed are those who bless you, and cursed are those who curse you. Notice the latter half of this prophecy given by this pagan prophet through the Spirit of God. Balaam begins not merely to bless Israel, but to bless an individual within the nation itself. In fact, Balaam begins to describe a king that will come out of Israel, a king who will have an exalted kingdom, who will come out of Egypt, and who will utterly defeat all the nations. But don't miss how this prophecy ends. He says, He crouched, he lay down like a lion and like a lioness. 
who will rouse him up? Blessed are those who bless you, and cursed are those who curse you. Now we've heard both of those phrases before, both in the book of Genesis and both involving blessing. We're familiar enough with the Abrahamic covenant to recognize that the language, blessed are those who bless you and cursed are those who curse you, was said to Abraham back in Genesis 12 by God. But here the blessing appears to be directed at this king, this individual who will reign over Israel and defeat the nations. This king will be the ultimate expression of the promises to Abraham as he carries the blessing that Abraham received from God. But where did we hear that lion language before? He crouched, he lay down like a lion and like a lioness. Who will rouse him up? Well, remember before Jacob died, he had gathered all his sons together to give them blessings suitable for each of them. And the namesake of the nation of Israel began to go son by son with a blessing. Well, let's look back at Genesis chapter 48, verse 9. We read this as Jacob blesses his son Judah. He stooped down. He crouched as a lion and as a lioness. Who dares rouse him? Balaam's prophecy is a virtual quote of Jacob's blessing of his son Judah. This is important because it allows us to connect these two blessing prophecies to the same subject matter. We can tell that the king mentioned here with Balaam is the same king that will come from the tribe of Judah and Israel. And we get to find out more about the king. He will somehow come out of Egypt. He will defeat the nations against him. And he will be the ultimate expression of the blessing in the Abrahamic covenant. This is monumental. And it's all coming out of the mouth of this pagan prophet, used as a mouthpiece by the Spirit of God. Now, as you can imagine, Balak is livid at all these blessings and prophecies that are pouring from the mouth of Balaam, as his eyes are open to God's plan. We read this in verse 10. And Balak's anger was kindled against Balaam, and he struck his hands together. Balak said to Balaam, I called you to curse my enemies, and behold, you have blessed them these three times. Therefore now flee to your own place. I said I will certainly honor you, but the Lord has held you back from honor. Balak is done with Balaam and gives up on the idea that Israel will be cursed. But then Balak gets more than he bargained for. The Spirit of God isn't done blessing through the mouth of Balaam. And suddenly Balaam begins speaking about what will happen in the end of days with this king he's already described. Balaam says this, Come, I will let you know what this people will do to your people in the end of days. And he took up his discourse and said, The oracle of Balaam the son of Baor, the oracle of a man whose eye is opened, the oracle of him who hears the words of God and knows the knowledge of the Most High, who sees the vision of the Almighty, falling down with his eyes uncovered. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. It shall crush the forehead of Moab. It shall break down all the sons of Sheth. Edom shall be dispossessed. Seir also his enemies shall be dispossessed. Israel is doing valiantly. And one from Jacob shall exercise dominion and destroy the survivors of cities. Balaam says something important here regarding the timing of this king who will come and reign over Israel. He says, I see him but not now. I behold him, but not near. Apparently Balaam sees this king, but knows that in the scheme of things, he's still a long way from arriving on the world stage. But when he does come, note the two items mentioned. Balaam said, a star shall come out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. Somehow this king will be associated with a star. And as we learned before, he will hold the ruling scepter as the king over Israel. But let's end with one other observation. The king is said to crush the forehead of Moab. Now perhaps you remember another figure who is said to crush the head of something. If you're thinking of the serpent in the garden being crushed, you'd be right. Remember the great hope after the fall of man was that the seed of the woman would come who would crush the head of the serpent. Here Balaam is saying that this king of Israel is going to crush the forehead of Moab. Not only is he associating Moab with the serpent from the beginning, but he's saying that the seed of the woman is none other than the king of Israel. In the span of just a few pages, God has opened the mouth of a dumb donkey before opening the mouth of a dumb and blind pagan prophet. 
And as God opens the mouth of his adversary, he speaks of the promised one of old. Balaam is allowed to utter a prophecy that serves to connect all the great promises of the Bible so far. The same seed of the woman Eve is the same blessing of the Abrahamic covenant, is the same king from Judah, is the same ruler who will defeat all his adversaries. Israel won't be cursed, Israel will be blessed, and their blessing will come in the form of a king. Join us next time as we see the alliance between Moab and Midian try a new strategy for defeating Israel. If the spiritual curse didn't work, perhaps the fleshly impulse will. The Bible Brief is brought to you by the Bible Literacy Foundation, dedicated to helping people like you learn the Bible.